So to uh, get the full impact of the two important lessons our gospel reading has for us today, I'm going to ask you to follow along in your bulletin as I read the same passage from Eugene Peterson's translation of the Bible called The Message. I think it'll help us put into perspective the, the two important lessons that uh, this, this passage has for us today. So this is the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When it came close to the time for his ascension, Jesus gathered up his courage and steeled himself for the journey to, Jeru to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead. They came to a Samaritan village to make arrangements for his hospitality. But when the Samaritans learned that his destination was Jerusalem, they refused hospitality. When the disciples James and John learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down out of the sky and incinerate them? Jesus turned to them. Of course not, he said. And they traveled on to another village. On the road, someone asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best inns, you know. And Jesus said to another, follow me. And he said, certainly, but first excuse me for a couple of days, please. I, I have to make arrangements for my father's funeral. Jesus refused. First things first, your business is life, not death. And life is urgent. Announce God's kingdom. Then another said, I'm ready to follow you, master. But first, excuse me while I get things straightened out at home. Jesus said, no procrastination, no backward looks. You can't put God's kingdom off till tomorrow. Seize the day. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please have a seat. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, if you ever felt like um, you didn't belong, or if you ever felt just like um, smacking someone who insulted you, my gospel reading has something today for you. This reading is only 12 verses long, but it has two important lessons for us that seem, I think they seem just like they've been written for us today. And I would suggest to you that both of these lessons have something to do with the idea of home. Home. And so I'm going to take them in reverse order. If you ever saw the movie The Wizard of Oz, Judy Garland had it exactly right when she clicked her heels and said, there's no place like home, there's no place like home. The only problem is that at least according to our gospel lesson, Jesus has no home. Our text says he has no earthly home at all. Some translations say he has no place to lay his head. And he says this while talking to a, a would-be disciple, and I just kind of love the way that Jesus never sugarcoats it when he's telling somebody what all is involved when it comes to following him. He tells this would-be disciple um, to think twice before committing. After all, he and his disciples are not staying in the best ends, like our translation says. And, and actually, being on the road with Jesus means you're going to learn something about what it means to have no earthly home. And I think this is true for those first disciples, and it's certainly true for us today. For those first disciples, it was true both literally and figuratively. For us today, it's mostly true figuratively. So, when Jesus decides to start his ministry. The Bible tells us that he leaves his home, his hometown in Nazareth, and he takes up residence in Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee. But you know, once Jesus takes his show on the road, so to speak, and he decides to start ministering all through Galilee, he decides he's going to preach in village after village, and, and, and it changes for him then. 
He doesn't have a permanent home. He goes through all these different villages. He doesn't even shy away from preaching in Samaria, which is really enemy territory, and it has been for over 700 years. Jews and Samaritans just didn't get along. And I guess what the point is here is that Jesus, once he got serious about taking his ministry all through Galilee, and then through all those um, Gentile cities of the Decapolis, up into Tyre and Sidon, and now down through Samaria, into Jerusalem, he literally didn't have a place to call his own. Now, I wouldn't say that he was technically homeless, but being on the road with Jesus would have meant creating plenty of living arrangement challenges for him and his followers. And he's upfront about that with these Folks who say that they want to follow him. But there's more going on here than just talking about a literal home. This idea of being without a home also applies figuratively to Jesus. And it applies that way to us today too. Remember in John's Gospel, when he's talking to Pontius Pilate, Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus' real home, his kingdom, is not of this world. At least not yet. Now this applies to Jesus and his followers back in the day. And I'd say it applies to us today too. There is just solid scriptural evidence and support for the idea that as followers of Jesus, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. John chapter 15 says, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. And then he says very much the same thing in this uh, high priestly prayer, just two chapters later. He's praying to God. Jesus says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. For they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not. So during this, this in-between time, this time in between Jesus' ascension and this coming again, we're called to be in the world, we're called to minister to the world without becoming like the world around us. Okay? So if as a follower of Jesus, if you've ever felt like you didn't quite fit in, this is why. The reason is that your real home isn't here. We've talked before about how followers of Jesus have dual citizenship. We're citizens of the, of the city and county of Tooele, yeah, some from Salt Lake County. We're all citizens of Utah at this point, maybe of the United States. And so it's undeniable that we're citizens of a certain geography. But more importantly, a higher priority for us is that we are citizens in the kingdom of God. This kingdom that Jesus established with his life and his ministry, with his death and resurrection. And brothers and sisters in Christ, let me be really clear about this. Our real citizenship our real home it's just not in the world the kingdom that's why you feel out of place our real home is in the kingdom of god and life in that kingdom is so very different from life in the worldly kingdom which kind of brings us back to the first <clears throat> lesson from our reading today 
I love that first part of this lesson. Uh, I think as we read through that, it's pretty clear that James and John, those two sons of thunder, as Jesus nicknamed them, they haven't quite made that transition from the earthly kingdom to the worldly kingdom. When the Samaritans deny them hospitality, they remember that according to 1 Kings chapter 1, that, that old prophet Elijah had one time rained down fire from heaven on Samaritans some 900 years before it. And guess what? They offer to do likewise. But did you catch that Jesus wants nothing to do with that? Retaliation might be a hallmark of life in the worldly kingdom. And we think about it, even Jewish law prescribed an eye for an eye, right? But that's not the way it is as far as Jesus is concerned. This lesson allows us to study that temptation that we have to use violence to get our way. And boy, do we need to hear that message today. And so we can ask ourselves, does, does, does suffering an insult or, or giving a, uh, suffering some kind of a loss, does that, does that give the injured party the right to retaliate? Even if that injured party is in the right or if they think they're in some sort of a holy cause. In other words, does the end justify the means? Do two wrongs make a right? And Jesus would answer that with a categorical no. Can't you, can't you just picture Jesus kind of rolling his eyes when James and John say, uh, wants to bring fire down on these guys? He, he doesn't want anything to do with that. As a matter of fact, Jesus rebukes them is what our text says, right? He scolds them a little for this rash response that they have. And you know what? This is, this is one of those times when Scripture interprets Scripture. Jesus is very clear about this kind of response in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Now, please don't take this passage as uh, some kind of a suicide wish. It doesn't make us doormats. What here, Jesus is talking about here is that when someone insults us in some way, like with a backhanded slap across the face, that we just don't go ballistic in our response. It's an insult, nothing more. So turn the other cheek. It doesn't mean that we can't defend ourselves when actual violence is threatened. So don't make that mistake. But today, we, we really need to be asking ourselves, is being right or having a holy cause, at least something that we think is holy, does that justify the use of force or violence? The disciples in our gospel lesson, they just haven't quite figured out yet this little tidbit about living in the kingdom of God. It's not clear to them yet that violence begets violence. But on this side of the cross, for us, looking back in history, we know for certain that Jesus comes to break that cycle of violence by dying and forgiving rather than by using retribution and force. So let me leave you with one last thought. That second lesson of ours from Galatians chapter 5 is maybe the clearest description in the whole Bible about the difference between living in the worldly kingdom and in the kingdom of God. Paul talks about the works of the flesh that characterize life in the worldly kingdom. And when you read through that list, that life isn't pretty, is it? It includes all kinds of sins and practices that sound very much like those kinds of things that we deal with today. And I kind of like the way Paul lays them all out, and I, and I really like the way the New Living Bible 
makes that list a little more understandable for us. According to the New Living Bible, Paul identifies those things as impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, encouraging the activity of demons, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger. And I love this one. Constant effort to get the best for yourself. He goes on to talk about complaints, criticisms, the feeling, oh, this doesn't apply much today, does it? The feeling that everyone else is wrong, except those in your own little group. And then Paul goes on to talk about these really huge sins, envy, murder, drunkenness, wild parties. And then he adds at the very end, no one living that sort of life inherits the kingdom of God. Tough words. But you know, life doesn't have to be characterized by those things. There's a better way. There's an alternative for us. It's living by the Spirit of God in the kingdom of God. And that kind of living, Paul goes on to describe, is full of what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's about not going ballistic when you're insulted. It's about not getting back at someone who does you wrong. So folks, just don't be surprised, I guess is what I'm going to say. If you feel like you don't fit in when the world around you is going crazy. Because your real home isn't in that worldly kingdom. It's in the kingdom of God. And it's among the people sitting around you today. That kingdom of God is best experienced and best learned about right here. Jesus' home and his kingdom was not in this world, and neither is ours. And I guess I would agree with the wise one who once said, we're not human beings have a, having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. I think that's right on the money. And when our human experiences threaten to overwhelm us, we can just take great comfort in Jesus' promise that we're, he's going to prepare a place for us. And that when everything is ready, he's going to come back and get us so that we can be with him always. That, my friends, is what having a life, having a home in the kingdom of God is all about. We're saved by grace through faith, and our real home is with Jesus, now and forevermore. Amen.